Greenock, 1874. The young men of Malton Terrace begin playing football in the muddy field by their homes. They choose the name Malton for the team and shortly after a committee is formed by five men. Alex Ramsey, James Alexander Farrell, Matthew Park, Robert Aitken and John Barry. They join the SFA. James Alexander Farrell was my great great grandfather and had a grocer shop in the wee Dublin area of Greenock, which is just where Catalog is at this, this time, you know. My grandfather told me that I, I had an ancestor who owned a stand at Catalog, but he never went into any, any more detail. I think he must have mentioned that, you know, part of the founder of the, cl the club. When I seen the name, for some reason I thought, this is the guy that he was talking about. Started making inquiries and found information about him in the book about, on the history of the Morton, yeah. where there was a copy of his, his signature and a um, team sheet in, in his handwriting. Any idea why he would have started that? It was to keep the young men from, from that area to keep them uh, from getting into trouble, getting starting to take alcohol and stuff yeah. like that, like you know, to give them, to give to give them something to occupy them, you know. Yeah. And this was how the club was founded in 1874. Members would pay a fee to join the club, and by 1866, the club was so popular that memberships were restricted to 350 people. The first team colours registered with the SFA were described as two-inch blue and white striped jersey, white knickers and red hose. The footballer in the 1870s would have looked quite different from those of today. In 1875, the field, on which now stand Octavia Cottages, was abandoned as it became apparent that it was too small to hold competitive matches. The team moved to Garville Park, located in the east end of the current James Watt Dock. Four years later they were looking for yet another ground, as plans were announced to build the dock. And in 1879 they moved to Capelo, where they would remain until this day, 131 years later. The 30th of September 1893. It is resolved that henceforth the club will be recognised as a professional organisation and the players were to be paid. This same year saw Malton join the Scottish League Second Division. On July 30th 1896, a limited company is formed with the full title of the Greenock Malton Football and Athletic Club Limited meaning that the company would now benefit from limited liability. So, now owned by shareholders and managed by directors, should the club fall into financial difficulties, they would only be expected to pay the amount of capital initially invested in the business. Capital was now no longer exclusively the home ground of Morton Football Club, and was utilised for many other purposes over the following years, from that of a racetrack to the alleged grazing ground for sheep, which were rumoured to have been used to keep the grass nice and short. More notably, the Glen Park Harriers held their annual sports meets in the ground during the 20s and the 30s, attracting large numbers of competitors and spectators alike. Eric Liddell competed along with the touring Canadian Olympic team before the 1924 Olympic Games to be held in Paris. March 13th, 1897. Morton managed to secure themselves a place against Rangers in the Scottish Cup Finals. The first time a club from Lower Renfrewshire had made it so far in the tournament, gripping Greenock in a cup tie fever. A record number of spectators crammed into Capelo, at least 12,000, little short of the ground's capacity. Unfortunately, disappointment was on the cards, as Morton lost to Rangers in a 7-2 defeat. This was to be Morton's first, but definitely not last, taste of a big football occasion. 
March 17th, 1902, Capel was to be host the Scotland vs Wales game. Scotland were to prove the better team, scoring a 5-1 win over Wales. The Greenock and Clyde Shipping Gazette reported the extra seating had to be provided to accommodate the crowd which numbered at least 12,000. In 1922, Morton found themselves against Glasgow Rangers in the Scottish Cup final at Hampden. Despite 75,000 Morton fans making the journey to support their team, morale and confidence were running low within the Morton side during the run up to the game. So much so that they were convinced they would be defeated and had no plans to return to Greenock afterwards. At the end of the game, Morton wanted to celebrate, but they had been so sure that they were going to lose that they hadn't brought anything to celebrate with. But Rangers, of course, on the contrary, had been so confident that they were going to win that they had. So Morton celebrated by borrowing champagne from Rangers <laughs> in the 1922 final. After scoring from a free kick early on in the match, Morton went on to play a great defensive game to finish 1-0 over Rangers, taking the Scottish Cup. William Gibson was one of the footballers in the Scottish Cup winning team and a recipient of one of only 13 medals made for the winners of that year. When the Great Depression occurred, he, like many others experiencing economic and financial difficulties, was forced to seek work overseas. In 1942, Morton signed Billy Steele, one of Scotland's greatest ever forwards. He played for Morton until 1947 and was entered into the Scottish Football Hall of Fame in 2006. In May 1944, Morton picked up a player and a free transfer. Jimmy Cowan was the best goalkeeper Morton ever had, and I think by far the best goalkeeper that Scotland ever had. The team at the time boasted many great players and they made it to the 1948 Scottish Cup final. Over 131,000 were at Hampton Park to see the Scottish Cup final between Morton and the Rangers. Midway through the first half of the Saturday game. Then in the third minute, Morton were awarded a free kick which White took. Watch the ball curve towards the net and form your own opinion about that win. Anyway, Morton were one up. And the crowd began to remember that in 1922 these same teams met in the final and Morton scored the winning goal with a very similar shot. Remember there were 12 minutes to go and I caught two Gillick. But in spite of that sort of thing, the Rangers Rangers. broke through for Gillick to equalise. And there was another 126,000. The light wasn't very good toward the end of the game. And very, very late on. And then came the incident which everybody is still talking about. It was very down the goal. And a photographer came out and took a picture. And our theory is that the flash got in Cairns' eyes, otherwise he would have saved it and it would go on to another replay and they would have got another 126,000. We're the end to a great cup fight. In 1960, Alan McGraw signed to Morton, where he would serve for a grand total of 36 years as player, coach and manager. When you played with Morton, what was your best moment? I had a lot of good moments. Uh, Every game was a pleasure to me, huh. and I remember them all. Are you regarded as a mortal legend? No, as a legend to me, <laughs> not a legend. <laughs> uh, but I'm just an ordinary man who, who liked playing football and I enjoyed it. That was all, that's all I can think about. Right, Three, yeah. that's no problem. In 1963, Morton signed Danish goalkeeper Eric Sorensen, opening a new avenue in Scottish football as other clubs such as Dundee United, Aberdeen and Hearts follow suit, attempting to attract foreign talent. He returned to Capelo in 1970 after a spell with Glasgow Rangers and became manager for a short time in 1974. In 1976, after turning down a four-year deal with Celtic, Andy Ritchie signs for Morton and quickly shows his potential and ability to score from free kicks. In 2001, Morton goes into administration. Let me tell you briefly about administration. It was an American invention. Someone realised that some companies that went bankrupt, in fact went bankrupt unnecessarily, Morton were placed in administration. 
which means that the court, the High Court in Edinburgh, appoints normally chartered accountants to run the club. And I was a spokesman for the consortium that actually got Morton out of administration because what you have to do is to get enough money to buy the club and secondly persuade the shareholders to accept and that persuasion was very hard work, believe me. And we almost faltered because we had the support of Inverclyde Council, particularly the then provost, uh, David Roach, um, and we had the promise of the council that they would give us a loan of about £350,000 to enable us to complete the transaction. There was a deadline of 12 o'clock in the Chartered Accountant's Office in Glasgow to deliver the cheque. But on the morning I was to get the cheque from the council, the council told me they couldn't do it. They, they'd run into a snag of some sort. I phoned Douglas Ray and he produced a cheque in that time for £350,000. So Douglas Ray did save Greenham Morton in a very important sense. But for that £350,000, I don't know what would have happened. So we got out of administration. Uh,